This program provides education, not advice. Sponsors pay a fee for endorsements and interviews. See the truthayf.com disclosure page for details. This is where technology, innovation, and personal finance come together. This is the truth about your future with Rick Edelman. It's Friday, January 26th. Coming up on today's show, a conversation with SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. But first, I want to talk to you about AI. You've been hearing a lot of hype about it, but are we really seeing anything exciting come of it? Yeah. And here's just one example. Google's AI company is called DeepMind. They've just discovered 2.2 million materials that were previously unknown. It's all about crystals. Scientists have identified 48,000 different kinds of crystals. That's a big number. Well, guess what? DeepMind has just created a library of 2.2 million new crystal structures. Researchers looked at 58 of those crystals that the AI said could be created. Within two weeks, they created 41 of them. And a thousand others are being produced, and probably all 2.2 million of them are going to be eventually made. We're talking crystals that could support superconductivity. That's where electrical current flows with zero resistance or hundreds of conductors of lithium ions that could be useful in batteries. If you think 2.2 million crystals is an impressive number, there's another paper that says the eventual number will be 32 trillion crystals, everything from glass to gases, gels, and liquids. But for all this excitement, let's remember that AI is one hungry piece of tech. Some studies are predicting that AI systems are going to consume massive amounts of energy to operate. Constellation Energy says that AI's power needs just here in the U.S. could be six times more than what we're going to need to charge all the electric vehicles we're trying to build. AI is going to consume as much energy as is used every year by the Netherlands. That's the equivalent of the entire output of 15 nuclear power plants. In fact, Microsoft is using its AI to speed up the approval process for new nuclear power plants to power its AI. And these figures don't include the power required to keep all the computers cool. The ventilation systems are going to need their own power. And that can double the total energy requirement. So there's one puzzle that AI needs to solve. How can it perform without needing so much power? Or where is it going to get the power that it does need? I hope it figures that one out pretty quick. By now you've heard that the SEC has approved 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs. The massive asset flows demonstrate the investor interest in these new ETFs. And if you're a financial advisor, I got to ask, are you able to make recommendations to your clients about Bitcoin? Can you explain to them what it is? Which of these ETFs are best suited for them? How much they should invest? You need to be able to answer your clients' questions. That means you need to become knowledgeable right now. Enroll in my online self-study course and become certified in blockchain and digital assets. The link to learn more is in the show notes. Coming up next, we'll be talking with SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, Crypto Mom, about the new Spot Bitcoin ETFs. Stay with us for more on the truth about your future. How should you think about Bitcoin? Turn to a specialist. For six years, Bitwise has been helping investors access crypto. Bitwise manages the world's largest crypto index fund. They also offer six crypto ETFs. You get cutting-edge insights, expert Bitcoin research, and a nationwide team to help. Bitwise helps investors and advisors navigate crypto with confidence. Partner with a specialist. Look for ETFs backed by Bitwise. Bitwiseinvestments.com. Carefully consider the extreme risks associated with crypto before investing. Support for Rick Edelman's podcast comes from Invesco QQQ. Meet Carmen, an everyday person who likes working in the garden, hosting dinner parties with friends, and listening to live music. She also participates in progress by investing in a fund that supports innovative ideas. Invesco QQQ ETF allows you access to innovators of the NASDAQ 100, so you don't have to be an engineer to help push progress forward. Anyone can become an agent of innovation. Learn more at Invesco.com QQQ. There are risks when investing in ETFs, including possible loss of money. ETFs' risks are similar to those of stocks. Investments in the tech sector are subject to greater risk and more volatility than more diversified investments. The NASDAQ 100 Index comprises the 100 largest non-financial companies on the NASDAQ. You can't invest directly into an index. Before investing, carefully read and consider fund 
and investment objectives, risks, charges, expenses, and more in prospectus at Invesco.com. Invesco Distributors, Inc. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future, and I'm very excited to be bringing on to our podcast today, Hester Peirce, Commissioner of the SEC, affectionately known in the crypto community as Crypto Mom. Commissioner, it's great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Rick, it's great to be with you. And um, I, I do want to start with my standard disclaimer, which is that my views as a commissioner are not necessarily those of my fellow commissioners or the commission as a whole. Thank you for that. Uh, let's launch into some of the questions that I've got for you. And, you know, we, we, you and I have talked for many years uh, on a variety of subjects, particularly uh, the spot Bitcoin ETF applications. A year ago, you were pessimistic that the SEC would vote to approve these applications. You didn't think it was going to happen and or certainly not any time in the near future. But last year, you know, starting around summertime with the speed of events, BlackRock's filing for the very first time of an application, the grayscale court ruling, other events, did the, the speed of those events surprise you? Well, I think that it was not surprising to see someone say to us in, in a court filing, hey, we think you're applying different standards to these products than you have to other kinds of products because... That's something that I believed to have been true for a long time. And as you said, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. I don't think either one of us would have uh, foretold this this uh, course of events. Um, but I think certainly having having someone challenge um, us on this was was not too surprising to me. And the result of the court ruling itself wasn't a surprise either. You know, again, I think the court saw that we were treating like products differently and was trying to figure out why. And, I, you know, those are some of the same questions I had. So I was I was not terribly surprised to see that result. You were uh, happy at the result uh, in the end game, meaning that the approvals finally occurred after 10 years, frankly, from the original application being filed, dozens of rejections from the SEC prior to your uh, joining the commission and in the six years, almost six years uh, since uh, you've been on uh, the commission. You, you're happy at the, at the approvals, clearly, um, but you also have expressed frustration that this took so long and required so much effort. Elaborate on that. Well, I mean, I think we shouldn't. So, yes, we should be happy that the products are available to people. And if people want to buy them, they can buy them. That's that's great. But, you know, I think we are in the situation where we where we are with all of the flurry around when is the SEC going to be approving one of these things and, you know, what's going to happen to the market. And it's just been this circus atmosphere around this. And I think that is a dynamic that we had a large part in creating. And so if we had just regular way considered these applications as we do for similar products and not, you know, not taken this whole different approach because it's Bitcoin, um, we wouldn't have been in this situation and it would have been better. And I think it would have been better for investors, frankly, and on, on a number of, uh, for a number of reasons as well, you know, having having them be able to access a cheaper product that more more closely and easily can track Bitcoin is better for investors, a product that they can ha hold alongside their other holdings in, the, in an investment portfolio. Again, I'm not advocating that investors hold or don't hold this product or buy it or don't buy it. But if you're going to, um, you know, people should be able to, to, to access the products that they want as long as those products go through the process and meet the standards that we've set out for other similar products. So I just I just think it's really it's really too bad how this came about. And even in the end, the vote was not unanimous. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I didn't see that we had a lot of a lot of room to maneuver after the court decision came out, certainly, right? There had been a pretty clear message that came from the court in my in my view. Um, you know, again, before even before the court's decision came out, I was sort of struggling to understand what the rationale was for our denials. It, it was it, this has been a very, a very difficult um, 
long time for me, right? And and looking at these at these applications and trying to struggle to understand what the standards are that we're applying and is the goalpost being moved as people bring in more data? Is the goalpost being moved? Um, so I just look. I I I think people should go and and read Commissioner Crenshaw's statement um, because it does go to great lengths to explain why she voted no. Um, and that will give you some insight into into her thinking on it. But I really thought we were in a position where we didn't we didn't have another path forward. And so now here we are. The uh, the spot Bitcoin ETFs are on the market. There are eleven of them. Uh, is this the end of an era? <laughs> this was a long time coming, uh, or is it the start of a new one? I mean, what's it all mean for Bitcoin specifically, crypto generally, uh, and for investors broadly? I mean, I think we'll see what you know, people are following the flows in and out of different funds. And, and so we'll see what happens on that score. And, and I, again, I don't, as a regulator, it's not my job to decide whether these products are right or not right for people's portfolios. Um, but I think it is, it, you know, it's, it does bring in a whole new set of participants into the marketplace that before would have had a more difficult time, um, participating and bringing their clients into this space and advising their clients. Um, so uh, I, I think that is a change. Um, but, you know, we'll see whether this means that we're going to see similar products um, in the future come out. And we'll see, we'll see what the market looks like. You know, I think it's it's one thing to look at it a week out, but it's another thing to look at it a year out and see where things stand. You mentioned uh, a circus atmosphere earlier. Um, there was um, so such a long period of time that these that this effort has been underway, uh, literally a decade, uh, and the industry was determined uh, to eventually get approval. That's why they kept filing application after application uh, and had hundreds of meetings. Uh, I can't imagine how much the legal bills were by the crypto community to to deal with this. Uh, they were determined. Uh, you were steadfast in your support, uh, and uh, it was um, it. It got to a frenzy to the point over the last six months, following the grayscale uh, court ruling, that there was just this frothy environment created of excitement in the crypto community and the investor community. Uh, all the surveys have shown us over the past few years that investment advisors were waiting for these ETFs to come to market, but for them to be able to engage in crypto. Uh, many compliance departments at a lot of financial firms saying no to crypto, but they'll say yes to the ETFs. And we're beginning to see that in the past week. Uh, and we have, as you've noted, generated, uh, observed a, a huge generation of uh, asset flows. Um, Bitcoin, these Bitcoin ETFs have already generated a couple of billion dollars in asset flows. Uh, the, the BlackRock product already crossed a billion dollars in just several days. And, and now the Bitcoin ETF is, uh, has more in assets than the silver ETFs, um, which suggests that there's, there's been this big pent up demand uh, and it's created, as you referenced, uh, a bit of a circus atmosphere about it. That, that circus atmospheres are not healthy uh, for the financial markets. They're not healthy for investors. Expectations get really too hyped up. And people are expecting with the advent of these ETFs that that's going to translate into get rich quick, you know, doubling your money overnight. Uh, I'm, I've am i expressed concern that people are getting a little too excited about this. I, one of the articles that I've written in our advisor toolkit is to temper expectations, to, to not expect quick profits and outsized returns. What cautions would you like to offer to investors and advisors about the, okay, now the ETFs are here, but what would you like to caution? No, I think that, that you're right to point out that it, people can get hurt when there is an environment like this, when people think um, that they have to rush into a product and, and, really what we want is people thinking carefully about whether this product is right for them. And I think exchange traded products are a really important innovation in the financial industry, right? In the financial world. And, and they can be very, very good ways for people to access different kinds of assets. Um, but that doesn't mean that this product is right for everyone or that any, uh, that, that, everyone needs to have or anyone needs to have a Bitcoin exposure um, in their portfolio. That's really something that an investor has to sit down and think, what are my what are my goals? 
what's my current financial situation? What are my hopes and dreams? What are What's my risk tolerance? What else do I hold in my portfolio? And that's a conversation that an investor can have with an investment advisor. And I think now, as you said, there are a lot of investment advisors who have wanted to take a look at, at these kinds of products. And, and so they'll do that. But again, it has to be a question of, is this right for the particular investor that you're working with? And, um, you know, there's no rush in getting it. I always tell people to be skeptical of everything. I think that's a good way to go into things, right? And and never feel, no matter what the product is, that there's that that you're going to miss out if you don't buy today. You always need to take the time and figure out what is right for you. Investing is not a it's 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 not an instantaneous process. It's a lifelong process, and you have to think about it that way. No matter whether you're talking about Bitcoin exchange traded products or traditional stocks or commodities or whatever whatever you're buying. Um, so I, I I think again that's why I don't like um, people to be thinking about regulatory approvals of a product like this as a seal of approval. All it is is saying this is something that can trade and now if it's if it's good for you that if you come to that conclusion with on your own or with the help of a financial professional, that's fine. Um, but do it deliberately and judiciously and carefully. Uh, a, a calm, cool head will always win. Yes. Uh, so what do you think might be coming next? Uh, we've already seen applications for 2X and inverse uh, Bitcoin funds. Um, there have been applications for Ethereum ETFs. Um, do you support the the notion of such ideas? I mean, philosophically, I'm not talking about the applications themselves, but do you see that this is a natural extension you know, that the Bitcoin ETFs were first, but we're not going to stop there and we're going to see more product development? I mean, I, I think we'll always see more product development. People have, uh, you know, if as, as people are very innovative in what they're thinking of. And so that doesn't surprise me. And I think we'll see lots of things that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, but again, the question for me as a regulator is, do these products meet the requirements to get to approval? And then let's let the market decide whether or not they want those products. That's not really my call, um, but I think we'll see a lot of a lot of people experimenting with different ideas in this crypto uh, adjacent space. You used a word earlier uh, and you had it throughout your uh, statement uh, that you issued following the SEC's vote. Uh, Chairman Gensler uh, did the same thing. Uh, Commissioner Crenshaw, all of the commissioners have used a specific word in all of your statements, uh, not only in your official statement uh, following the vote, but in casual conversation. You've done it here today. And I want to highlight this word because um, I've noted it with curiosity uh, and I don't think most folks are paying attention to this. So I just want to ask you this. It's probably a geeky point uh, that only folks like you and other finance geeks like me care about. But you have referred to these as exchange traded products, not exchange traded funds. Technically, as I read the S1s that the applicants all filed, and I look at the SEC's uh, ruling, and I look at all the individual statements from the commissioners and yourself included, you are you're all very clear, very specific that these are ETPs, not ETFs. Does anybody other than people like you and me care about that? Is this a material fact that investors need to be paying attention to? What's the difference between them? Well, I think people should. I, I mean, this this is can be an area of confusion whether or not something is you know how something is classified. Um, but I think understanding a little bit of the regulatory regime and whether or not it fits within the protections of the of the Investment Company Act of 1940 is kind of what's driving all of us using the term exchange traded product. We typically use the term exchange traded fund when it's when it's a fund that's under the protections of the 1940 Act, and that's um, there there that is an act that was put in place to um, really make sure that that products being offered to retail investors um, had certain protections around how they're managed and making sure that the managers are working for the 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 uh, the fund as opposed to working for their own interest. But again, I mean, people need to take that into account when they think about these products. Um, clearly, 
there are exchange traded funds are not the only products that people buy. Lots of people buy other kinds of exchange traded products that have different kinds of protections, including the disclosures that you just mentioned, right? So that's, you can read about the product and how it works um, in some of the disclosures that we require. And, and there was a lot of back and forth in producing those disclosures. But again, I just want to underscore that no matter what, whether it's an exchange traded fund under the 1940 Act or an exchange traded product more broadly, um, you, you need to think about whether it's right for you. There is no SEC approval, seal of approval on these products. We do try to make sure that the disclosures match what actually happens at the fund. But beyond that, you know, you really have to make a decision about whether it's right for you. And so I guess uh, it's fascinating to me that although these are technically exchange traded products, pretty much all of the 11 refer to themselves as exchange traded funds. Well, there's no official um, glossary on exchange traded products of which I would say exchange traded funds are a subset, right? There's no official terminology there, but I think that's how, um, you know, I, I think it it is good to understand which regulatory regime something falls under. So um, that's something people can pay attention to. And and uh, just for everyone's clarity, there are uh, exchange traded notes, there are exchange traded commodities, exchange traded right. funds. In other words, all dogs are animals, but not all animals are dogs. And some people have talked about whether we need to have some sort of official nomenclature. Um, so that's, you know, some people think that that would be important. But I think really what's important is to, if you're buying a product, to look at the disclosures to understand how it works. Um, and, and that's something you can get on all of these kinds of products. Uh, before I get to my last question, any other points that you'd like to make about this entire uh, conversation of the spot Bitcoin ETFs? No, I mean, I think, Rick, you and I have been talking about this for how many years now? I think we first talked about it probably five years ago, right? I think so. So it's been a long time coming. And I and um, I hope that we can just we can just close this chapter. And I hope that the SEC can more broadly um sort of revisit how we've thought about crypto, I think that will result in a better environment for everyone, an environment in which it's easier to distinguish the good actors from the bad actors, which is something that I'm concerned about. If you haven't a, a regulatory, um, you know, if, it, if there's a lot of regulatory ambiguity, it can become very difficult for people to distinguish the good from the bad. So maybe this is a moment where we say, hey, let's take a look more broadly at how we've been thinking about crypto and let's start um, engaging with people so we can get to a place where there's good disclosure out there so that people can make their own choices. Uh, and you kind of alluded to this uh, as my last question for you. Uh, I think uh, you're looking forward to not having to spend a lot of time on this topic for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely am. I mean, uh, it, this has been something that um, people have been asking me about a lot over my entire time here. And, it, and you know, this is this is the point, right? This is back to the circus atmosphere point. It shouldn't, the regulator's role should be one of consistent application of the law and not adding to the melodrama. And so that's my goal for this agency is not to add to the melodrama. Well, I share that aspiration. I wish you the best in that effort. Uh, although I love spending time with you and, and seeing you and hope I'll still have a lot of opportunity to do that on a lot of other issues the SEC is facing. I think we'll both look forward to not having to bandy about conversation on Bitcoin. Well, sounds great. It's been fun to talk to you again, Rick. And and uh, I hope that, yeah, I hope that you you enjoy a break from the topic as well. Uh, but unfortunately for me, it's the beginning, not the end. Now that the ETFs are here, we're busy training advisors on how to use them and how they work and the differences between them. So my work, thanks to you, my work has just begun. Again, I hope people are, are you know, careful in making their decisions. And, and I look forward to seeing what other kinds of products come across my desk. That's Commissioner Hester Peirce of the SEC here on The Truth About Your Future. Thank you so much for your time today, Commissioner. Thank you, Rick. Take care. The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman is brought to you by Schwab. Schwab Trading is now powered by Ameritrade to give you a new elevated trading experience tailor-made for trader minds. 
Go deeper with Thinkorswim, the powerful award-winning trading platforms now at Schwab. Unlock support from the Trade Desk, a team of passionate traders who live and breathe trading like you do. And sharpen your skills with an expanding library of online education crafted just for traders, all designed to help you trade brilliantly. Learn more at schwab.com slash trading. Support for Rick Edelman's podcast comes from Invesco QQQ. Meet Henry, an everyday person who enjoys reading science fiction, keeping in shape at the gym, and spending time with family. He also participates in progress by investing in a fund that supports innovative ideas. Invesco QQQ ETF allows you access to innovators of the NASDAQ 100, so you don't have to be a rocket scientist to help push progress forward. Anyone can become an agent of innovation. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. There are risks when investing in ETFs, including possible loss of money. ETFs risks are similar to those of stocks. Investments in the tech sector are subject to greater risk and more volatility than more diversified investments. The NASDAQ 100 Index comprises the 100 largest non-financial companies on the NASDAQ. You can't invest directly into an index. Before investing, carefully read and consider fund investment objectives, risks, charges, expenses, and more in prospectus at Invesco.com. Invesco Distributors, Inc. Thanks for joining me today on Monday's show. Are we headed for a market meltdown regarding home ownership? I'll see you Monday. Bringing clarity to a complex and changing world. This is the truth about your future with Rick Edelman. 